your story, uh, The Woman at the Well. And I always uh, enjoy the fact that whenever that text is read and we get to the part where Jesus says, go get your husband. <laughs> and uh, she says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, that's right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. There's such a contemporary uh, feel to that. <laughs> Jesus is just kind of telling the woman about herself. I, I really love that text. And in years past, when I've done passion plays at other churches, uh, it's, that's just a funny scene. It's always just a lot of fun. But have you ever had the chance to meet someone that you've heard about, or uh, someone that you've seen on TV, or even meet somebody that you've admired from afar, and maybe you've been in an airport and seen a famous person, or happened to look on the airplane, or you walk past, uh, unless you're like, uh, some of you may travel first class, I don't know, but sometimes when you walk through the first class cabin, sometimes there are famous people sitting there, particularly if you're departing from Chicago. Uh, on one hand, your reaction might be, oh my gosh, that's so-and-so, you know, it's him. You might think, oh, well, she's shorter than I thought she'd be, or he's more handsome in person than I thought. Most of us don't have the, um, the chutzpah, the audacity, to actually walk up to a famous person that we just happen to meet in a random mode. Some of you might. Um, some of you would have no problem, and some people would just go right up and ask for an autograph and, you know, just sort of hang on to that person. And, Usually the famous person is then really annoyed because <laughs> you're, you know, you're invading their privacy or their space. Years ago, um, in the early 80s, when I first moved to Chicago, I was downtown at Water Tower Place. And I just happened to see Oprah walking through uh, Water Tower Place. And this was right after her show went national. Many of you may remember she had that show, AM Chicago. And this is right after the show was syndicated. And she had this entourage of about six or seven women that were with her. And she had on a full length fur. And she was in real, what I call diva mode. And she was just walking down the center of the uh, corridor there in Water Tower. And I thought, oh my god, that's Oprah. And I have to say that I was somewhat disappointed because she was moving through with this entourage. And she was, you know, just very grand. And I thought, that's not really the persona that she portrays on TV. I was just a little disappointed to see her wearing her fame so openly and readily. And of course, I didn't approach her. I never do that sort of thing. Um, but I wondered how she perceived herself walking through the hallway. Sometimes we do run into people like that out in public who expect us to recognize them. And they are somewhat disappointed if we don't give them all the excitement and, you know, all oh, that they think they are due. Several years ago, right after Walter and I were engaged, we were asked to serve as co-hosts of the concert. He used to be the student director of a gospel choir at Northwestern called the Northwestern Community Ensemble. And they were having their annual spring concert. And the students had invited, uh, initially him, but I guess I was just brought along for the deal, um, <laughs> to serve as co-host for NMCs for this concert. Well, as we entered the auditorium, we were invited to sit down in the front row. And the gentleman who was seated to my left, I see this so clearly, um, Walter had leaned over to introduce me and said, this is Terry, this is my fiance. And I said, okay, very nice to meet you. And he said, well, you may have heard of me. Uh, my name is, and I won't use his name, Walter said I can't use his name because somebody may know who he is. I think Mother Owens is probably the only person who will actually know who this guy is. I'll call him Don Banks. His initials are DB though. Um, he said, well you may have heard of me, I'm Don Banks and I uh, write and produce the Thompson Community Singers. I'm sure you've heard of my music. And I, with the sweetest smile, said, oh Don Banks. I said, no, I don't think I have. <laughs> May God forgive me for being so nasty to this person. But I just, it just got me that he made this assumption that I would know who he was and that I would clearly be tickled to actually meet him. You've met people like that, right? Who are just so proud of who they are that you must surely have heard of them, know their work, and be just honored to be in their presence. 
Well, the look on his face was priceless. And every time I see this guy, I just have to laugh. And he, I can't pretend not to know him anymore, but he still has an unfortunate ego. Um, nonetheless, we are blessed by his music. Well, anyway, in our text today, the woman at the well uh, is, this story is just full of kind of unexpected revelations. And the woman has expectations that are probably pretty low for this encounter with Jesus. Her expectations are not only exceeded, but they're exceeded on so many levels and in so many different ways. First of all, the woman is at the well at an unusual time of day when most women would not have been there. She's a woman of ill repute, as Jesus points out to us. She is not only, has not only had many husbands, but she's actually living with someone who is currently not her husband. And it's likely that she was just trying to avoid the gossipy women who would certainly have talked about her. Let's not forget that the people of the Bible were indeed people. So just because you read the King James does not mean that these people had no sense of spite or gossip. I am sure this woman was talked about and everyone knew her business. Uh, and so she probably just wanted to avoid those uncomfortable moments. She was not expecting to find anybody at the well. And in the first century, Jewish men and women did not interact with one another unless you were married to them, unless they were a family member, and certainly a woman would never speak to a man and a man would never speak to a woman unless there was another party there to make introductions and serve as a chaperone in the conversation. Two people who were not married to one another simply would not have been socially uh, invited to engage in any sort of conversation. So she was not expecting to find anyone at the well. She wasn't expecting to find a man whom she did not know. She wasn't expecting this man to stop and speak to her or even take notice of her. In fact, a proper Jewish man would have gone to a different place to get water so as to avoid this very uh, uncomfortable social situation. <coughs> this man would never have spoken to her to ask her for a drink of water. Another unexpected circumstance is this Jewish man would never have spoken to a Samaritan. The text gives us some clue that Jews and Samaritans don't share things. Well, they basically hated each other. Um, they were both descended from Jacob, as she mentions. This is our father Jacob's well. But the Samaritans lived on one side of the Jordan and the Jews lived on the other. The fastest way to get from Galilee to Jerusalem would have been to go through Samaria. But the Jews went out of their way to go around Samaria to go to Jerusalem. The Samaritans were descendants of Jacob who had intermarried with other peoples. And this was considered to have made them unclean, impure. They were sort of a, considered a mixed breed race. Not only were they not necessarily pure Jews, but they had different ideas about where God dwelt. The Old Testament is full of references to where the Lord dwells. And the people are commanded that you are only to worship God where God chooses to dwell. Whether Jews and Samaritans were of two different opinions as to where that place was. The Jews believed that God's chosen dwelling place was in Jerusalem. The Samaritans believed that God was still high on that mountain in Gerizim. So, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus' clothing, his accent, his dialect, all would have identified him as a Jew. Why was this Jewish man speaking to this Samaritan woman, gossiped about, a woman of ill repute. And the Samaritan woman's responses give us a clue that she finds the whole situation just highly irregular. And she replies pretty consistently to Jesus' inquiries with what she has been taught. Well, this well belongs to our father Jacob, and the place to worship is on Mount Gerizim. And how do you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman? And if this water that you're talking about is so wonderful, where can I get some of it? How will you get some of it? You don't even have a bucket, and this well is pretty deep. She has no expectation at all that Jesus will essentially call her on the carpet for her own personal life drama. 
No one, not even today, would probably say something to you like that if you were in the grocery store. So, where's your husband? You would say, not only I think you're a prophet, but it's none of your business, <laughs> whether or not I have a husband. And she goes on to confess her darkest secret to a stranger whom she shouldn't be talking to anyway, who's actually violated all the social laws and is someone from a group of people that her people detest. That's right, she says. You have spoken the truth. You must be a prophet. No one could have known that. Well, I have to believe that Jesus had a little chutzpah as well as a little loving kindness as he approaches this woman. But he does not do what she probably further expects, and that's condemnation. All he does is proceed to talk to her about how God is not limited to a place, that we do not worship him in one place or the other, but the day is coming, he said, when we who worship God will all worship together, he implies, in spirit and in truth. He makes no condemnation of her status, of her reality. He only shares that this will happen. And she says, oh, I know that when the Messiah comes, we all believe that, that things will be okay. He will teach us everything. And then he gives her one final piece of information that she does not expect. I am he, the one who is talking to you. I am the Messiah. All of these unexpected revelations, all of these anticipated responses that just don't happen. She is approached, she is recognized, she is spoken to. She is encouraged, and she's even affirmed in the midst of her personal drama. Well, one of my favorite parts of this story was actually not in the text, and at the notion that Jesus would actually be the Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for, the woman leaves her water pots, that precious commodity in this dry, rocky place that takes so long to draw from the well that she came at a special hour to get. She leaves her water and her water pots there and runs into the city and says, Come, you got to meet this guy that I met at the well. This guy who actually told me about myself. He knows my business. He talked to me. And she probably could have added in, He is not at all what I expected. How many people do you know? that sadly have such low expectations of what it means to know God or what it means to be in church. Maybe like the woman at the well, they have been hurt by the gossipings and the hateful language and the just ostracization that people have made of them. Maybe they walked into a church and no one said hello. Or maybe they got into an argument with someone and felt misunderstood and left. Or maybe they experienced the condemnation of someone in the church. There are people out there who have low expectations of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And that's why it's often so hard to talk about God or church because people have the expectation that it's not a good place to be that church people are somehow judgmental and not loving and not caring, that God doesn't really care, that all they will get from God is judgment and condemnation. But this woman is amazed because her expectations have been exceeded. The anticipated responses were not given. She expected to be cast aside, to be ignored, and she was embraced and loved. Did you see him? You need to hear what he said. Are you kidding me? Don't you know what I just experienced? She goes from being someone who was avoiding everyone at all costs by going to a different hour at the well to becoming a bold witness, running through the streets of her city to say, listen to me, you have got to meet this person. 
Well, the people who she talks to say, oh, well, she sure seems excited. Let's go talk to this guy. So they go to meet Jesus and they invite him to stay for a while. And after a few days of conversation with him, they come back and they say something even more amazing. It's not just because of what you said that we now believe. It's because we've heard and experienced for ourselves. And we can say with you that truly this is the savior of the world. Another expectation turned on its ear. Women had no credibility in this society. They couldn't sit on juries, they couldn't testify. In biblical days, a woman would need three other people to confirm her story before her word would even be taken as evidence. So she has no credibility. It's another reason why Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and telling her to go and share the news is so revolutionary because women just weren't believed in that way in those days. Another expectation simply turned on its head. What will make us bold witnesses? I think it's this experience of the unexpected, of our expectations being exceeded, of not finding what we thought we would find. And you hear it all the time when people come to church and say, wow, that church is really friendly. Sadly, they're not expecting us to be warm and friendly. Or, I enjoyed your sermon. I remembered that. I don't think people expect anymore to understand or enjoy sermons. Sometimes people come and they think, oh, I'm just here and I'll just sit and I'll get what I need. But how wonderful to have our expectations, our anticipation exceeded. In those moments when we come face to face with something raw and sincere and real, when we meet not with judgment but with love and with grace, that gives us a boldness that we probably didn't know that we had we hopefully become compelled to share the story, maybe not by leaving our water pots and running through the streets of the city, but maybe enough to invite someone to church, maybe enough to say, you really need to come to Bible study. Maybe enough to say, you gotta come and help support our back to school fair. Because maybe you've seen the faces of the people whose expectations have been exceeded when they come and are ministered to here on our campus. So what's your bold witness going to be? Can you speak to some expectation that God has exceeded for you? If so, your response can only be to leave your water pots. In other words, leave the ordinary mundane things aside and move forward so that whatever you do, whatever you say, you do it with enthusiasm, you do it with bold energy to say, you gotta experience what I have experienced. The boldness doesn't come just from emotion and passion. The boldness comes from knowing that you know what you've experienced, that it's made a difference for you, and that you want someone else to have that same encounter that same experience and you know that once they've encountered it they will like the people in Samaria come back to say you know it's not just because you said so but now I've had my own encounter and I agree with you this is something special this truly indeed is the savior of the world bold witnesses I hope that you will find that your expectations of God continue to be exceeded and that you will find energy to leave your water pots and run and tell somebody. However that running, whatever form that running may take, be sure that you don't decline to share that holy, bold witness. Blessed be the name.